Well, welcome back. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the extra few minutes we allowed you to have. <laughs> and uh, now following up from our technology panels, we'd like to uh, show you an application panel where these technologies are used in very interesting and informative ways. Um, David Metcalf will um, moderate the panel. David is the director of the Mixed Emerging Technology Integration Lab, METAL, at the University of Central Florida Institute for Simulation and Training. Additionally, as a serial entrepreneur and investor, his past projects involving XR and Internet of Things span across education, health, space, cyber, and transportation. Current efforts include smart cities, blockchain, and enterprise learning transformation for government and industry. David, please introduce your panel. Thank you, Ben. Well, it's great to be able to follow up with, with, from the technology panel and continue on some of the themes of partnership and application areas. It's so exciting to see some of these different areas, too. And uh, today we have uh, three distinguished speakers with us, too, that are going to talk about their application areas in education, in medicine and health, and in space. All things that are important to our Central Florida economy and that are synergistic with simulation and particularly the theme of our conference today of XR. So I'd like to invite our panelists to come up and I'll just say their names and their, their, their titles, but not their backgrounds. I'll let them do that too because otherwise we take up the whole hour session with the credentials of this, this fine panel. So we have uh, Dr. Haifa Mamar, who is the um, Education Director for Emerging Technologies at Full Sail University here in town. Great partners, uh, too, down the street uh, from UCF. And then we also have uh, Dr. Pam Boyers, who is the Associate Vice Chancellor and Clinical Simulation uh, Director and, and uh, Assistant Professor of, at the Department of Surgery at the University of uh, Nebraska Medical Center, too. So we're welcome to have her, too. It's been such a contributor to the simulation industry over the years. And Dr. William Little from, uh, from, from my home over on the coast, too, that uh, is the lead on the things that we're going to look at and the synergy of these various areas, too. So um, if we cue. And looking at the synergy across industry, across government and military, across health, and even some of the social causes and social need are important elements of what we've been um, thinking about in terms of how we partner across this. I see so many faces from government, so many faces from industry, so many faces from education and academia, and also from our nonprofit sector, too. I think that's one of the things that makes Orlando's application areas really magical, too. Whether that's looking at advanced applications within um, education and how we train our next generation of students, to the way that we might train our um, medical professionals too and use these in actual application and practice. We've been working with some of the latest advances in holograms with no glasses for surgical pre-planning too with uh, some of the Israeli technologies that we've been working with as well as some of the things from my NASA background too that we'll hear more about as well too for how this is being used in space and industry too. All of these things tie under our umbrella of the Internet of Things, and how we're using simulation, almost like our theme from the last year, too, of the digital twin, and tying together these various areas, even if those are not your three application areas, too, that you're involved in, too, if you're involved in transportation, logistics, if you're involved in, uh, in, in industry or media, those are some of the different areas that will still have applications to the things you're going to see today from our great panelists that are, that are coming up, too. With that, I'd like invite uh, Dr. Mamar to come up and, uh, and, and present to us first. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Hi, everyone. My name is Haifa Mamar. I'm the Education Director of Emerging Technologies at Full Sail University. Uh, I oversee the uh, schools of gaming, computer science, simulation visualization, mobile web, and uh, cloud technologies. has video, so I need to time myself on this. Oops. 
and we need to restart it and it has audio as well, please. So. Looks like we're having technical issues here. <laughs> it yeah, I want to get it restarted and then if I can get it on the screen because it has multiple projects I'm going to be talking about and um, I need to see where I am. <laughs> Thank you. So basically the video that I'm going to show here is a sneak peek of uh, the programs we have at Full Sail. So as you've seen in the video, um, at Full Sail we do AR, VR, and XR projects, and I broke them today into three different categories, training, explaining, and entertaining. So in the training category, basically what we're doing, we're training a user on performing a certain task. Um, most of the projects I'm going to show are students' projects. Um, at Full Sail, Full Sail students, um, and we work with subject matter experts to get an accurate um, training that we can uh, provide. So most of them are proof of concept of a certain training. So um, this tool was actually designed by one of our instructors uh, of the SimVis program. It's the Victor Math. He noticed that um, students in the gaming and in the simulation and visualization program struggles with um, uh, vector math, which is an important concept in AR and VR courses. So what he did is students can use this tool to sketch a vector and then they can use the calculator to add a vector, perform a dot across product, and visualize the result in 3D. The cath lab, we're, we were approached by um, a group of people that specialize in cleaning uh, cath labs in hospitals. Um, of course, the idea uh, is not to bring people to hospitals and bring more germs. So they asked us to do a VR application where we can provide that training and uh, it has a checklist to assess the training and how it's going. This is an award-winning student project. They received an award at ITSEC. Uh, the Dental Madness here is a combination of AR and 3D printing. So not only you can see the patient and the teeth, but also you can feel the teeth. And it became really a good training uh, because, as you know, um, dentists use the mirror and they look in reverse. So it was a good training to call out uh, the teeth and memorize them. 
the Pump Repair. This is another student project. Uh, and the cool thing about this project, it's networked. So we have several trainees from this location joining to perform this task of, of repairing uh, the pump. And um, it was really so they can hand pieces to each other, look at each other, see each other, talk to each other, and it became really a cool project. <clears throat> the hand tracking project, again, this is another student project, and um, there's a trend of like, we're trying to use the hand and not using controllers or uh, gloves. So we're mapping um, in this project, which was, uh, we did a mapping of um, the switch uh, with um, actually a board with real switches, and it had um, a combination or like actually a virtual board with virtual switches, and we were using a leap motion to track the hand and track the motions, and then we can perform the in, in XR. The second area is explaining. Sometimes we struggle to understand a certain concept. It's not easy to visualize it. It's not easy to understand, especially in 2D. So. Um, the project that I'm going to show now is actually, um, it was uh, designed by one of our instructors, and it was to visualize data in 3D. So as you see in this video, um, we're trying to understand the correlation between data, uh, between data. And then uh, the data set we're working with here is um, it's cities, ships, countries, individuals, and events. And then as then, pulls the nodes, we can see the relationships between those nodes. And as he pulls more nodes, we can see the second level relationship, third level relationship, and understand how all that works together. So a lot of the applications um, that are AR, VR, or XR actually are for entertaining purposes. Um, and um, we're trying to give the user a certain experience, an immersive experience. So um, again, the projects I'm going to show, some of them are uh, students' projects. Uh, the first one was is the paraglider, and it was actually uh, built by Rob Caddo, who's here in the audience. He's our program director of the simulation visualization program. And it's given an immersive experience. We're trying to give the user the experience of paragliding. And then also, it was uh, combined with an action game. So it's fun, it's engaging. And most of the time in these types of experiences, we're adding extra senses. So in this case, it was the smell sense, and then we added winds. In this project, The Wizard of Oz, um, here, as you see, uh, it's a fun project. So we're having the student who is in the right, uh, right side of the screen. He's controlling the, the, the digital puppet here. And he's using controls and to control the motion of the face, the expression of the face. And he's actually behind the screen. And then any user can come and interact with this uh, avatar and talk to him. This last project. Uh, it's a uh, motion base. Um, actually, we, the more senses you add um, to an experience uh, beside the, odd, uh, the visual sense, uh, the deeper the presence is and the greater the sense of immersion is. So we see, for example, um, theme parks right now, they're adding haptics. They're adding um, the sense of, um, of uh, smell. So here we're adding the sense of motion, and we have uh, we added the six GOF um, to pre give the user the sense of motion. So at Full Sail, we're not just building games; we're building experiences. The next one is if we combine the explaining and the entertaining, we can get a really cool idea. So the project or the video I'm going to show is actually, um, now we can see most of the companies, they don't want uh, to just start a project without knowing how it's going to look like or how, um, um, how it is going to be represented. So basically what we did at Full Sail, I don't know if you guys know, last year at Full Sail we uh, jumped into eSports and we um, actually opened our, uh, it was the largest eSports arena in the U.S., campus arena in the U.S. 
um, and uh, collegiate arena in the US. And then um, before building that, we were asked to present, we were given a model and then we were asked to present a VR experience, see how it hits, and then we start building it. So the video is going to show, it was actually the Channel 9 uh, coverage of how it was in 3D, the, that experience. And then the end of the video will be how it looks today because we built it already. And um, for those of you who don't know, it will, be, um, it will show our uh, eSport team, full cell eSport team, Armada. And actually they play in 11 leagues today. A green screen and goggles allows a virtual look inside Full Sail University's newest venture. But with the magic of technology, I'm able to take you inside what the arena will look like using virtual reality. And it's a, it's a big game changer. been to Full Sail recently, please come see me and we have our, like, like the table of Full Sail here, please come see us. We would love to have you on campus to tour our facilities. Thank you. <laughs> Great job blending the uh, education and entertainment together too to train <laughs> your future workforce. But what I'm going to do is show you how we've made some significant investment in uh, mixed reality and how it's beginning to be applied to people in healthcare, not just uh, students, but also um, practicing physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and others. It's a highly collaborative project. There are lots of stakeholders. And what I'm going to do is start the tape and then talk to you first uh, visualization application that you'll see because it's a little hard to interpret if you are not actually in medicine. But one of the things that's very important to us all is our clotting system. It's a very fragile system, and for us to have good and functional lives, it has to be going well. But if there's trauma, significant injury, uh, some kind of drug reaction, uh, certain illnesses, viral, viral, viral illnesses, and so on, they can greatly impact the clotting system, and the healthcare providers have to really, really understand it. And not only do they have to understand it so they can diagnose, they have to know when to intervene. Does it need to be sped up? Does it need to be slowed down? Uh, you know, what needs to happen to make this pe person well? So quick diagnosis and intervention is really, really critical. So um, imagine that you are um, an injured cell and that this is actually in 3D. Of course, you'll be seeing it in, in 2D. And then you're following that, you'll see some other applications which are more self-explanatory, but some of them actually come from uh, CAT scans of real patients. They've been depersonalized, but I just want to be show you what's beginning to emerge from this lab and applied to the teaching process, but also to the patient care process and to diagnostics. It's fine to run the tape now. I'm using the word tape, it ages me, doesn't it? Dates me. <laughs> Got to do a transition. <laughs> so it's actually very beautiful. It reminds me of when I was a child seeing Walt Disney's Fantasia. But imagine this in 3D and in 3D immersive environments where the people who are learning about this complex uh, clotting factor, it's called the coagulation cascade, where they can actually be inside that, manipulate it, halt it, we're in the process of labeling it as well, and there will be a narration with it. But it can actually be seen on their iPhones or their, their mobile devices. Uh, it can be seen on um, you know, a flat screen, an interactive screen, but it can also be seen in the head-mounted display sets as well as it's being prepared to go into the total immersive environment, such as a cave, and maybe perhaps into true holographic form. So what we're doing the challenge um, in healthcare 
is that we face a significant crisis in terms of how we train and keep healthcare professionals up to date. And the challenge of medical errors, preventable medical errors, and in particular avoidable deaths. While the figures range, the estimates range in, in studies from 250,000 people a year to 400,000 lost to avoidable, medical, avoidable death through medical error, there is some controversy about those figures and methodology, but even if it's 50,000 people a year lost to medical error, it's far too many. So we consider this as a call to action. So this $120 million project has been supported by the state of Nebraska, the Board of Regents. Uh, the federal government is also involved, uh, some of our industry partners and private uh, philanthropy. And everyone has got together around creating this interprofessional simulation center that actually has five levels. And the reason it has five levels is because in healthcare, we can't yet rely on virtual reality to teach. There are, for example, no haptics, uh, not a lot of interaction yet, uh, a dearth of medical content, and we have to create our own, and that medical content must be super, super accurate. But we do need to teach psychomotor skills. We need to, need to teach interprofessional skills. We need to take, teach interpersonal communication skills. And they need to, the healthcare professionals need to practice, 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 practice until they're competent at certain things, procedures, managing scenarios to take care of patients. So the five levels have fresh tissue on the top floor because there are simply some simulations that cannot be done without the, the wonderful people who donate their bodies to medical science. Obviously, not everybody practices on those. It's, they're only used as necessary, but they're still a very, very important part of simulation in healthcare. The other level has human patient simulators and procedural and task trainers. And they're set in hospital environments or virtual healthcare environments, I should say. And actually, in our new building and our new facility, we can replicate the whole healthcare system why is that important? Because errors occur from errors in diagnostics, delayed diagnostics, infections, uh, hospital-inquired infections, you know, pharmaceuticals, but a critical element of errors um, are, is the communication between healthcare teams and the handoff of, one, of the patient from one level to the next. Pa patients transition through the healthcare system. So we have home environments, community environments, ICUs, pediatric units, all where we can practice this transfer as well as the skills to particular to each, each discipline. Then we have the visualization floor. And this is where the biggest um, excitement is about because um, it involves holographic technology, mixed reality, a cave, CAD walls, and actually a holographic theater. And like some of you were experimenting quite a lot with holographs, especially since we have a real obligation to the whole state. Um, if we just had everything in Omaha, it wouldn't be fair and the standards of training and the standards of care are just as important in the rural communities. So like the, some of the speakers we heard before, we're practicing and working with remote and distributed learning across the state. It's, I don't know if you've heard this, but it's, I learned this. It's called the 500-mile wide state. So we actually have a series of interactive um, digital walls that are connected through collaboration software. Um, we have six of them now, uh, that one based in Omaha and the others are scattered around the, in the state. One as far west as Scotts Bluff and the Western Panhandle. And we can collaborate in real time, interact in real time on these interactive digital walls and communicate, able to see one another and see what everybody's annotating on their walls. It's, it's actually very exciting. So the real focus is on improving human performance and effectiveness in healthcare. 
So with everything we're doing, including uh, the applications for virtual and immersive reality, they're the hidden things that are so important, and that is, how do we know this huge investment of $120 million makes a difference? <laughs> and uh, I think that's uh, that and competency-based assessment models are sort of the holy grails, if you like, of our journey. How do we measure? How do we know it makes a difference? And as, um, as um, our, our colleague Dan uh, Ayud from Microsoft said, uh, you know, it certainly excites learning, we know that. We really believe in seeing evidence that it accelerates learning, and we're certainly seeing some evidence that it shortens the time to competency. This is very, very early days, so I say this with much caution. But it does behove us, all of us, to say, you know, is this investment uh, making a difference? We know the students love it. Um, we know that for faculty, as somebody said earlier, it's a little harder. And so we put a tremendous amount of emphasis on making sure the faculty are engaged, they're not left out. With construction nearing completion, the Davis Global Center on the University of Nebraska Medical Center campus in Omaha, Nebraska will become home to a transformational program called IXL. In this newly constructed center, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, dentists, and allied health professionals will routinely practice and hone their skills. By accelerating the adoption of interprofessional simulation in healthcare, the Davis Global Center is poised to meet the IXL vision of improving human performance. So, so what you can't see as you look at this 2D image is that that is actually on a holographic stage and that that figure and those, the faculty, for example, can be beamed out uh, to the other sites and interact with the other sites. <clears throat> And I think um, perhaps the most extraordinary part of this, um, excuse me, <clears throat> this journey has been uh, the extraordinary collaboration, not only between the entities that I described who have partnered to make this happen, but also between the healthcare disciplines. I meet every month with all six of the uh, health science deans who are tremendously engrossed in how can we teach interprofessional, how can we teach teamwork, you know, using this new facility. So that's just a little glimpse into our story and how we're, um, how we're applying uh, augmented and virtual reality and mixed reality to healthcare at the University of Nebraska. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Boyer. Great overview for those of you in the health professions, uh, interprofessional education, advanced technology, and that same public-private partnership that we heard our mayor talk about and that we've heard some of the presenters talk about today, too. Another fine example of that that is a shining example from our state is NASA and what that's meant for us and kind of the proliferation and reinvigoration of space, too. And to talk a little bit about some of the practical applications in that area for us, we have uh, Dr. Little, if you'd come up and join us. Thank you. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, a little uh, full disclosure here. I am not a doctor. Uh, I am merely a master. <laughs> Ken, we'll talk about that later. Uh, I, I'm the lead of the augmented slash virtual reality lab at KSC, or the AVR lab as we know it. And what you see there, the charter to investigate the new XR technologies that are coming onto the market, learn how they work, determine their strengths and weaknesses, and recommend potential applications of these technologies to the work we do at Kennedy, uh, processing spacecraft, launch delivery systems, and ground support equipment. Having said that, that's what I tell management when they come around asking me, how am I spending taxpayer dollars? The truth is, I'm trying to build Tony Stark's lab. <laughs> Good, I don't have to explain anymore. You get it. So this is, a, this is an image of the lab. It is in our operations and checkout building. Uh, I've been working at this now for seven years. Uh, the AVR lab came about indirectly as a result of the end of the shuttle program. 
when uh, wheel stop of SDS-135 happened in July of uh, 2011. Uh, the transition of KSC from a single mission dedicated facility, i.e. shuttle, uh, Apollo, Soyuz, Apollo, Gemini, uh, Mercury, uh, we started transitioning into this current multi-user spaceport uh, way of, of thinking and doing. Uh, at that time, 11, 2011, 2012, uh, we were kind of casting our, our way about trying to figure out how we were going to come in, how we, oh, don't do that, uh, we, NASA, civil service, could fit into this, this new uh, world. Uh, a group of, of younger engineers uh, came up with the idea of spaceport innovators uh, to look for innovative ways of doing our business. As part of that, they, they created a kickstart uh, competition where you present a, an idea to a group of uh, judges made of NASA uh, senior management. If they like it, then uh, they'll fund you uh, to start working on that particular idea. Uh, I pitched an idea for what I call the virtual control panel, uh, which uh, got accepted, and aha. The, the virtual control panel, and we, the lab has done all three phases of XR, uh, mixed reality, augmented reality, and virtual reality. Uh, virtual control panel, when uh, the user is in the virtual environment, what he or she sees in front of him is a set of buttons, you know, virtual buttons that you can interact with, touch a button. and what happens then is that that interaction with that virtual object uh, creates a command that then goes out to a physical object, and then that physical device goes off and executes whatever that command uh, is. So I have uh, a little uh, robot, a little make block uh, commercial uh, uh, hobby kit robot that and I can push a button, go forward, and it'll go forward and backwards and turn left, turn right, and so forth and so on. Uh, now, at the same time, there I have a, a 360 degree camera mounted on the robot that feeds the, the, its video back into the virtual environment. So what the user sees while operating the robot is what the robot sees. He sees the world from the robot's point of view. Uh, potential application for this uh, would be uh, imagine an astronaut on board space station or gateway or a Mars transfer vehicle who needs to do uh, routine maintenance and, and repair operations somewhere outside the vehicle on a system outside. Uh, then uh, he gets into this environment, uh, runs a free flyer from uh, in the outside so that the free flyer goes off and, and does the, the maintenance operation uh, on, on some external system. Uh, that alleviates the astronaut from having to suit up and do uh, an extravehicular activity in EVA, which inherently is a hazardous operation. He sees, sitting right in front of him, uh, a model of the Mars Curiosity rover. And then he can walk around it, interact with ES Max or, or one of those tools. Uh, converts it into uh, a format and size that will fit into a Unity environment so that you can take those CAD models into the virtual environment so the, the engineer, the user, can then uh, look at, inspect, interact uh, with uh, equipment that may not have even been built yet or needs to be modified for, uh, for use uh, here uh, or at, at KSC. Uh, one of the problems with that uh, use of, of CAD models is, uh, for those of you who, who've been in that world, uh, high fidelity models built down to, to the nut and bolt level uh, especially when you get into very complex systems like spacecraft, those models can become very, very large, uh, to paraphrase Carl Sagan, 
billions and billions of polygons. What we're trying to do is take out uh, pieces and parts that are hidden, that's, that, that aren't, the engineer wouldn't see, uh, uh, the, the pieces uh, like the nuts and bolts with the, the threads on the screws. Uh, take those out if they're not germane to what the, the uh, engineer wants to see or needs to see. Reduce the count of, of those polygons, decimate the models, or, you know, reduce polygon count, and then take them out of their uh, original format and put them into a format that uh, Unity will accept so that then we can take those, those models to the user. He doesn't have to come to our design visualization group who've, who've got uh, computers the size of, of refrigerators uh, driving these, these models. Uh, that generates uh, a lot of, of, of savings and time and energy. It puts, it puts that capability on the user's desktop or laptop right there at his workspace so he doesn't have to go to uh, a third party to to see his models and uh, this is uh, this is a, a, a high level architectural diagram of, of Armit uh, the interesting part from the education uh, point of view uh, for for this project is that it got its start last summer over the summer semester I had three interns working in the lab with me and we wanted to know can we take a uh, CATIA model out of that environment and put it into unity uh, so I had the, the interns working on it one of my interns is now uh, he took he took what he was working on back to his school uh, he was in an interim between graduating with his bachelor's degree and going on to get his master's degree. Uh, he took it back to the school, talked to his advisor, and she was so impressed by what he did uh, and what he was working on. That became his thesis, and he will be, he will be uh, defending the thesis next month, and I have the privilege of sitting on his thesis committee. Um, one, other, uh, the other, one of the other interns is now a hardware engineer for IBM. And the third uh, was, uh, he graduated in May and is now, uh, he was a Pathways intern, for those of you who know what the, the Pathways system is. Uh, he basically graduated and now has a full-time job with NASA at Kennedy Space Center, working for me uh, and working exclusively on ARMIT. Uh, so those are the kinds of things we're working at, uh, working on in the uh, XR world at Kennedy Space Center. That's, That's it. great, thank you. So now we'll begin the uh, panel portion. Now we'll begin the panel portion as well too. So if some of you have questions, please raise your hand now. And while you're raising your hand and someone's coming around to you with the microphone too, I have a question that picks up on that too. It's kind of the same type of question, the great question we had about, from Dan uh, about teachers and what they need to know. What do our students need to know to be equipped for this century and the next too? in these fundamental skills that are gonna be able to be the building blocks for XR, whether that's in engineering and, and space, or whether that's in health and uh, medicine or in education and entertainment. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you guys think? Sure, you can start. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna jump on my soapbox. Uh, my, my, uh, my thought is that this acronym that we all know and love, STEM, doesn't go far enough. It should be STEAM, or that A for the arts. Uh, you know, why, why, why teach students about painting pretty pictures or looking at sculptures or such like that? Well, it does a couple of things. One, it, it develops a, a more uh, critical thinking skill within, within the student. Uh, another is that it, it enhances the, the, the right brain thinking the, the what-if uh, type of thinking so that you can look at an uh, engineering problem or science problem and turn it around. You know, a lot of, okay, I've worked with a lot of, of mechanical engineers and electrical engineers, and they get, they get stovepiped into a specific way of thinking, and, they, you know, if, you know if, every, if every problem looks like a nail, well, use the hammer. Let's give, them, let's give them the tools. Yeah, so, so you're able to kind of take that and the same way we think about the links between 
music and math or medicine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and kind of tie that in with the arts or the, the examples that had so much artistry that both of you presented too and that uh, Full Sail's been working on too really has those, those sensibilities. What else? I think for me, I would think students or the, the, this generation of um, uh, students, they're already familiar with the technology. Mm -hmm. Most of them um, use the technology already in gaming or in other application, AR, uh, Pokemon Go was already an application that everyone was using. So um, I, I agree with Bill. I think having that mentality, having uh, the st STEM or STEAM, <laughs> I agree, is like the critical thinking. Um, and the desire to really apply and understand the technology, this is what we need. But the instructors, the professors, are a big part of this as well because they need to inspire, they need to um, show projects and show what we can do with things. So having the students who is interested in doing it is great, but also having the professor who can help that uh, that education is also very important. I love that. Inspire yeah. that innovation in that yes. next generation too. So, go ahead. Um, well, I couldn't agree more with the adding the A to STEM. <laughs> um, in our case, I think for the same as you, the students really take to this like ducks to water. Um, but w the issue for us was creating content and finding the workforce and the personality profiles who could work together as a team. So the team that created some of the content you saw is small but mighty. And we have an artist, a medical artist, we have a computer programmer, a web developer, graphic designer, um, and they're hard to find alone, let alone finding those that have the character and the personality who can work as a well-oiled team. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually have found we had to grow our own. <laughs> so we <clears throat> partnered quickly with um, company called Eon Reality, who set up several training academies uh, around the world because it was for the same reason. And uh, we, we run a couple of those a year. Yeah. To, and then we hire them. <laughs> so, so you talked about interprofessional within the, within the medical professions, but now you're talking now, about yep. interdisciplinarity, That's right. where you have to have, again, teamwork. Yeah. And think about the ways that uh, those come together too. Do we teach that enough in our work settings, whether that's skill or knowledge too? Uh, Eric, do we have any from the audience that we wanted to take to? I, I, did, I thought I saw a hand go up, but uh, if not, I'd, I'd love for you guys. While we're, while we're uh, there's one over there. Uh, if we, if we uh, while we're waiting for the mic to get over there too, just really quickly, your favorite application or use case of, of AR? Do you have one? I mean, the, AR, MR, uh, seriously, the projects that we have at Full Sail, like for me, um, like data visualization one is for, for me amazing. The hand tracking is amazing. It's like those are like, uh, that's why it's like when I see the, like what our students are able to do in all these projects that they're designing, um, like. Those are fundamental those. building blocks too. So that's yes. really important. Yeah, anything else? Uh, actually, I have three, two of them I covered here, the, the virtual control panel and uh, the, the virtual rover. Uh, there's a third one, uh, Vector. In fact, I have Vector here today. Uh, when you go out the door, look to your right. Uh, and the, the, the poorly marked table, that, that's me. Um, <laughs> but what I like, what I really love about those, thing, those, uh, those uh, apps is that we take them out to the public and, and show them at, at uh, public outreach, uh, education outreach, uh, Otronicon, uh, Megacon, uh, some of the events in, in the area. And invariably, when uh, someone puts on a headset and, and sees that world, the first words out of their mouths are, is, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, and, and I love that. I love that, bringing that those things too. Inspiring that excitement too. So it's about to ding you for choosing only your own projects too, but. Uh, well, no, <laughs> Vector great. wasn't my project, but. Uh, yeah, no, that's yeah, great. I, great. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Anything that's. Uh, oh, it's very similar things, but I think the, the one of the biggest um, excitement, excitement moments was while we were focusing on education and training and improving uh, the outcomes of education and training, uh, it was when the clinicians began to realize they could use it to educate their patients, the parents of the child with the strabismus mm -hmm. surgery, um, 
and also begin to use it for pre-surgical planning. Ah, yeah. And uh, yeah. that opens up a whole new vista. Yeah. I have one that I saw and we, we helped with a little bit too that uh, was how do you have like XR and? So we had an augmented reality and a brain gateway that Dr. Uh, Andrews, if you want to talk to her too, Dr. Anya Andrews from our College of Medicine at UCF did. So you have a brain gateway connected to the AR so you can have the basic building block of focus and thought control within AR, maybe XR and MR as well too. So uh, there's just a lot of things when you start to combine technologies the same way that Dan talked about AI and other things too, holograms with no glasses. So uh, it's exciting times within there too. So we do have a question over there. Hi. Hi, um, my, my name is Pat Breedy. I'm with Orange County Public Schools. Great. <laughs> My team over there. Uh, so you had mentioned earlier about having interns, um, college interns, with your within your uh, company. So it, and in our experience, that we're finding that companies need to be really be drilling down a lot uh, lower and hitting on the high school students and creating those high school internship experiences. So my question is. Is, is that consideration and where can we go to make those connections? Because if you want to capture these students in that career field, it's going to have to come a lot younger and we see it every day when students are in elementary school and all the things that are happening, but we really need to capture these students to make those career decisions younger and for them to select that field. And if they're not exposed to it as young as a high school level, even younger, then how can we capitalize on that opportunity? Great thoughts on that? I know, I know NASA has a ton of programs at the high school uh, level too. Yeah, uh, we First do. outreach and stuff like that. Uh, right, uh, and speaking of Orange County Public Schools, I've been to a, uh, at least two, uh, if not more, of the Orange Technical College uh, STEM days uh, to, to talk with students. <laughs> you heard someone, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, the um, Orlando Science Center. We, yeah, Electronicon and those are too, yeah. I see full sale outreach into the community in, in great yes. ways too. Yeah, we so, have a uh, great department actually of outreach. We go, um, um, I mean, They're everywhere in the US and, and even everywhere. internationally, actually. Yeah. Um, actually, um, right now we have what we call the Tech Fest. Uh, it's starting, um, I think, this week, if I'm not mistaken. So we're actually uh, visiting 16 local schools here in, um, in Florida, and uh, we're taking over their gym. We're going to have different experiences from gaming, uh, from uh, IT, from mobile, web, simulation, VR, and esports competitions as well hey, just to you're get getting them when they're five and six years old starting in eight weeks, right? Uh, they, yes, they have I mean, we have, already, right? we have <laughs> to have those students. <laughs> yeah, we you, talked about that, all that experience. You have to start, they already they know that. They go from fans to developers, right? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, shout out to some of the programs we have here, like the, uh, the, the, t the Corridor, too, that does so many STEM outreach programs throughout the Central Florida area. It's been incredible to see that outreach and how it touches so many students from the National Science Foundation and some of the other grants that they do too, as well as the big events like our upcoming ITSIC and others too. Mm -hmm. And I think we're getting to the close of our time. <laughs> it's time for lunch. We don't want to hold that out too. <laughs> we'll stick around okay. for a few minutes if there's anything so, else that you guys want to talk to the panelists about. All right, so let's thank our application panel. Very nice job, very interesting. Okay, so um, now it's time for lunch, and if you'll all just go on out here in the hallway, there's uh, buffet lines, and then come on back in and have your lunch, and then we'll reconvene, and George will take over at one.